Prince Charles calls her absolute genius. Dame Judi Dench said, charming and so very, very funny. Jeff McBride, <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> Okay, oh, take, take three. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Prince Charles calls her. <laughs> Prince who? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we only have like an hour. No, it's fine. <laughs> I don't need to answer any questions. It's fine. You just. You just yeah, no, I'll just do the intro and then we'll be done. All right, here we go. Okay, here we go again. <laughs> This is John Abrams, and this is The Variety Artist, episode 36. Anybody that listens to this podcast on a regular basis knows that I'm a family entertainer, that I specialize in performing for schools and libraries. Well, it never fails. Every show that I do, some kid runs up to me and says, hey, mister, is magic real? I have my stock answers, and then the kid runs off and tells his friends what I said. Well, this interview got me into thinking. Is there real magic? Well, the answer just might be in this interview. Today's podcast is brought to you by audible.com. They're offering you, the variety artist, a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at thevarietyartist.com slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Just go to thevarietyartist.com slash book right after this podcast and get your free audiobook. Now, let's start the show. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. Prince Charles calls her absolute genius. Dame Judi Dench said, charming and so very, very funny. Jeff McBride calls her one of the brightest shining stars in magic. Beautiful visual magic with a comic twist and best-selling author of her memoirs, Spun into Gold, The Secret Life of a Female Magician. Variety artist, I give you the diva of magic, <laughs> Romany. Yay! <laughs> I made it through. Well done, John. That was very, obviously very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here. I got to well, tell you, even before we start the podcast, you are one of the nicest people to do business with. I was messaging you and you would message me right back and you had fun things to say. And you're talking about the movie, The Star is Born and Bohemian Rhapsody. And you're just very friendly and I appreciate that. It's also called procrastination. So I was meant to be like packing for my gig on Sunday. And so instead of that, I was on Facebook talking to you. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. <laughs> so a little extra typing procrastinates just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I learned to type when I was 18 before, um, you know, the internet. And I love typing. It's like playing the piano, but you know, I can't play the piano, but I can type. I can type really fast. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did, too. I learned on a here, here's how old I am. I learned right. on a manual typewriter mm -hmm. in high school. I remember a couple of things about that class. I remember that one when you did the big test, they would put a piece of paper right. over your hands so you yeah. wouldn't be able to see the key. I did that. Yeah. 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 You had the same thing. But isn't it great? I mean, the thing is, everyone can type these days, but I really still like it. It's like, yeah, and, and back then you were employable because you could type. Right. Yeah, I worked my way through college because I could type. Now, you went to college. Did you go to college in England? I went to university in England. And, and the reason I went was because I wasn't allowed to go to stage school. Oh. Um, I really wanted to go and learn theater and dancing. But, you know, my parents were very sensible. And so I went and got a, a good degree instead. What, what was your degree in? Well... English, English literature, which is fine, and Italian, which I can swear to you now, I have never used apart from to order an ice cream, a gelato, which I could probably have done in English. I took French in high school and now you I can, used it? Well, I can read a menu. Oh. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, me too, right. So if I'm at a French restaurant, I can order. That, that's, that's about as And I can, I'm really good at eating Italian food, you know. It's... We're going to talk about your performing career, and we're going to talk about um, all sorts of different things. But tell me about, I love these names, Walkabout and Bongo. Well, of course, Bongo, my dog, is named after Ali Bongo, of course. Because oh. um, Ali Bongo was a great friend of mine. He was, as everyone who knew him, he was a really, really lovely man. And I say this because he was my friend, and... and I must admit, at his funeral, everyone was competing 
to say that they were his friend more than anyone else. And I think that's the mark of someone that everyone loves. Yeah. But you know what? When I first met Ali, I was not impressed. And the reason was, this is at the Magic Circle when I first started, because I had all these big ideas which came to nothing because I didn't know anything about magic. Yeah. So I just had lots of theatrical ideas. So I'd say, well, I want to disappear in the middle of the stage. Okay. And that's my ending. And Ali Bongo would say, well, that, well you don't want to do that. And now you can imagine this petulant, almost going back to being five years old and stamping my feet. Because, yes, I did want to do that. Yeah. And he said, no, you don't want to do that because you won't get any applause. That's right. People will walk out of the theater and they'll be like, oh, she's gone. Where was she? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but then I got to know him and then I realized actually he knew a lot more than I did. And then I got to really like him. Oh, good. So that's why the dog was called Bongo. And the man is called Walkabout because he, like you, is called John. Uh-huh. It is not possible for a Roman Diva of Magic to have a boyfriend, husband, whatever, called John, because it's just, no offence. It's, <laughs> it's really boring, right? So when I met him, he didn't have a job, because he'd been a Buddhist monk, and he'd come out of being a Buddhist monk, and he didn't have a job. So me and my friends called him John Man of Leisure. So <laughs> okay. but then when we got Bongo, he decided to be a dog walker, so then we called him Walkabout. Oh, so they are inter- intertwined. Right, yeah, they are, yeah. It was him that said, shall we get a dog? And again, people that have read the book will know that the reason why we got a dog was that I was out in Dubai doing 90 shows. Oh, wow. And John was a new relationship, and I'd taken him out to Dubai, and I was hoping that he could be my stooge or my stage manager, or at least I could stick a sword in him or something. On stage, not off. Either, I don't care. (laughs) And he found the whole thing boring. Oh. There's the whole, you know, doing two shows a day, hanging around. Yeah. And so I realized that I couldn't have him and a career traveling around the world. And I wanted him. So I said that I would only go away for two weeks at a time. And, I, and that's when he said, should we get a dog? And so we could get a dog. Ah. But I feel quite proud of that because I have turned down a lot of bookings. Even, you know, people have called me up for a six month thing. And I haven't even asked them how much because I didn't want to be tempted. Yeah, I've done the same thing. I, my kids just recently moved out of the house. My second one just recently moved out of the house. And mm-hmm. I did all gigs all in Southern California for right. 20 years. And yeah. now they both moved out. I've started touring. Mm-hmm. I started doing uh, California. And now I'll move into the other states and, and right. hopefully around the world. That's the idea. It's funny because I've just been doing the audio book today. And, um, and the chapter I've been doing is this actual chapter, which is probably why it's in my mind. And the ch- title is, you can have anything you want but you can't have everything Uh, right because you know the world these days says oh you can have everything but i think you can have anything but maybe not everything Mm -hmm. you know maybe you have to make some sacrifices for the things you really want you know let's talk about that a little bit Mm. Uh, i was i was doing some research on you and some of the articles you've written are about manifestation and, mm-hmm. and positive thinking. You can become anything you want to be. So yeah. Let's talk more about manifestation. You know, I think magicians, what we're doing is uh, making an example of manifestation. We're saying, look, I make this appear and book it, it happens. So, you know, we're pretending that we can do it to remind people that they can make things happen that they want to happen. So in 2006, I read The Secret and then I discovered that, you know, I went into research and the law of attraction and, you know, this whole thing about the story that you tell attracts things to you. Now, before I learned this, I had been saying magic is difficult, gigs are hard to come by, Mm -hmm. making money out of magic is hard, and I never practice, which was all true for me. Mm -hmm. And I've been saying this for like 15 years. And then no wonder... That was what was happening. And then I read all these books and I was like, whoa. So I started changing the story. I started saying with a gritting my teeth, um, I love practicing and my show is really coming together. Mm-hmm. My friends would look at me really puzzled because this was not the Romany they knew. They, they'd been listening to me moaning about never practicing. And then I started getting up early and writing down a list of everything that I wanted to manifest. Nice. And now I'm living it. 10, 15 years ago, I wrote down that I wanted to live in a, a beautiful house with a theatre. I wanted a Diva mobile, which is basically a VW camper van. 
and that I wanted a, a, a loving partner and a beautiful act that made people smile and brought joy to people's hearts. Um, ironically, I didn't know about the dog, but I think that was a bonus that I got. <laughs> and slowly, slowly, well, quite quickly, actually, all that fell into place. Uh-huh. And I still do it every morning. I'm a great believer. And people like Tony Robbins and all these big, maybe self-help gurus, he has this thing called, which is hard to say, three to thrive, Mm -hmm. which is basically you take three things and every day you focus five minutes on them. The biggest thing that changed my life was acting as if. So rather than acting as if you can't have it, you summon up the feelings of having it already. So when I'm going running, which I don't really like, and I'm running along, instead of going, oh God, I'm running, I think, oh, Oprah's assistant has just rang me up to see whether I could come into her studio to talk about the book. And I can run for half an hour without noticing that I'm running. Yeah. Thinking, what am I going to wear? It's going to be great to fly business class for the first time. And, um, you know, <laughs> you have this thing in your imagination. And then I found it comes into your life which may sound woo-woo, but I think if you don't believe in magic, what are you doing as a magician? No, no, it it doesn't sound woo-woo to me only because I have experienced it myself. Uh, Before I started doing magic, I did bookkeeping for small businesses, as strange as and as far Mm -hmm. of a leap as that sounds. And when I started doing magic, I said, this is what I do for a living. Mm-hmm. And that was my mantra. This is what I right. do. I'm a professional magician. This is what yeah. I do for a living, even though I had just started out. And right. sure enough, within six months or a year, I was completely doing it for a living. Right. And yeah. the second thing that I manifested, which goes along with exactly what you're saying, hmm. we were living in a house that was um, less than desirable, let's say. Mm-hmm. And I made a list of all these different things uh, that I wanted my house to be, including a a cul-de-sac. And there was a bar. When I was a kid, I had a bar between the kitchen and the living room. So I wrote that down on the list, a pool, a jacuzzi, and all of that. And so sure enough, about a year and a half later, we moved, and I found that piece of paper that I had written all those things down on. And I pulled out that piece of paper, and I read it to myself again, and the house that we moved into, into had all of those things that were on that list. Coincidence? No, I'm a big believer. And, and that's what's happened in my life. I, you know, I have got a little theater in my house and I have got, <laughs> who knew, a, a lovely husband. And, you know, and it, it's all come together. But you, you don't stop there. Maybe my things have changed now that, now that I'm quite comfortable because you know, 15 years ago, I didn't have any money and I was in one rented room. And yeah. I was practicing between the bed and the window with the mirror balanced on the bed in fact half the bed was covered with hardboard and loads of tools and glue and things because I was making props uh-huh. on half my bed so I was actually sleeping with magic you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know and I just sort of sleep on one side so now I have a workshop and and it's all much easier and so now it's it's more about having more fun and having gigs that are really fun and not stressful and now it's about teaching other people how to do that it's like giving that knowledge on sure once you reach those goals you mm. you set new ones because i work on six star cruises like many magicians and i work on seabourne which is at least a thousand pounds a night and these people all have private jets and you know they they it doesn't make me think i want a bigger house or i want a bigger car or anything sure. what i want is more time i want more time because in that time I want to do stuff I want to do. I want to write and I want to read and I want to, you know, make things. And so what I always want is more time. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, tell me about your theater in your house. But this is a Jeff McBride thing. So he has a theater in his house. Mm -hmm. And when I went along to him many years ago, he just said, well, you have to have a theater in your house. (laughs) So I was like, okay. And in my very first tiny house I ever built and bought rather, we put a tiny, tiny theater in. This is when I was married to um, a juggler. And so we would put on these tiny shows. We could get in about maybe 15 people. And we had a mixture between the neighbors and my more artistic friends. And the neighbors had never seen anything like it. (laughs) So we'd get them in. And that's really how I practiced my early material. Because, you know, I was a street performer. And the street performers always said, until you've done an act 100 times, 
don't even think about it. You know, you've got to do it a hundred times and then you can start to go, well, is it good? Is it not? So I had a thing on the wall and I would just tick off every time I did a, another show in, the, in my home theatre. Mm. So it's a really good place to practice. And so when I bought this house, I said to the estate agent, I need a house with a big enough living room that I can have a theatre. Yeah. And of course he looked at me as if I was completely mad. <laughs> so we can get 25 people in here and... I don't do it that often because it's quite a lot of work. You have to clean your whole house, get wine, get food, get... When the people come and there's 25 people sitting quite up close to a stage show, their awe and their wonder is amazing. Yeah. You know, and they're so happy afterwards. It's much more intimate than a big, giant 2,000-seat theatre. I mean, it's not a commercial concern. I just do it for fun. I mean, I do charge for tickets, but, you know, I could earn much more money having a gig. Oh, yeah. It's a really nice thing to do. Now, your birthday is just a few days away, right? What are you yeah, doing? Yeah, I am 50. Ah! I know. It's so, I'm so excited being 50. It feels like a big achievement. <laughs> that is. I'm really excited. Obviously, we all work at parties. Uh-huh. So I don't want to have a party. <laughs> yeah. I quite, when I say I like running, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really like running, but I do like adventures while running. And I have a friend who's an ultra runner. What he's gifting me for my birthday is to meet at five o'clock in the morning in the dark on the hills somewhere with a group, anyone who wants to come, probably a group of my friends who are runners. And then we're going to run, run for sort of three hours oh my. into the sunrise. We start, we're going to start off with a walk apparently, which is good. Um, and then we're going to run into the sunrise. <laughs> and that's his gift for me. And we don't know where it is. It's going to be in the countryside somewhere. And then when we get into the sunrise, then we've all got hot drinks and cakes and we're going to have that in the camper van. Oh. Yeah, that would be exciting. <laughs> Are you doing something for your customers or for your, for your, your clients? I, I did send out him a mail out just oh. now to my mailer saying I'm 50 and inviting them, obviously, to this run. And obviously no one's going to come. And they've, <laughs> so far today, they've all sent me back great excuses <laughs> for why they can't come. But I did put on it... I said, my greatest desire is for this book, this book that I've written, to go out into the world because I think it will help people. Mm -hmm. And so for my birthday, for the celebration, I would love you to buy a copy. And if you have bought one already, then buy one for your friend or recommend it or write a review. And so I've been absolutely blatant. And I've just said, you know, what I want for my birthday is for everyone to read this book. That's very smart of you to do. So there's a story that goes along with the book in that one of my great heroes is, I'm sorry, is Elizabeth Gilbert. Sure. Now, Elizabeth Gilbert is the author of Eat, Pray, Love, but she's written a book that I highly recommend to everybody called Big Magic. Yep. There's no tricks in it. It's not about magic as we know it. It is about getting on and doing what's, whatever your creative endeavor is. Do not think you're too old, too fat, too whatever. Just get on and do it because the world needs that gift that only you has got. And it was her book that made me write mine. Oh. I really wanted to get my book to her. I wanted to thank her for her work because not only that book, but also her podcast, which I also highly recommend. They're called Magic Lessons mm. and they're free on iTunes. People that want to do any creative endeavor, like be a stand-up comedian or be a dancer or whatever, call in and explain how they're finding it difficult. And she really helps them find a way to get through. Nice. For example, it was two o'clock in Germany and I'd done a big show for I think 2000 people. It was two o'clock in the morning. I was having one of those mornings where I just felt, what was the point? <laughs> I don't mean yeah. in life, I mean artistically. I felt as if I hadn't really done what I wanted to do. And I listened to her podcast and she gave me new encouragement. So there I am. I want to get the book to Liz. But when I go to give her the book at a workshop, wearing a golden cat suit and clutching 30 gold balloons <laughs> with my book in the other hand. Why did you have balloons in your hand? The book is called Spun into Gold. Okay. I thought it would be really cool. So this is typical Romany. It wasn't really cool, but I thought it would be really cool. <laughs> if I, <laughs> this is what's come into such trouble in my life. Good ideas that when. So I thought it'd be really good if I wore a gold catsuit and blew up 30 golden balloons because then I thought I'd walk in and she couldn't miss me because I'd have these golden balloons <laughs> and I could say, hey, this book is for you and you really encouraged me and thank you very much. But the thing was that I was on a cruise 
the day of this workshop. Mm. So this cruise was three hours from London, but I got permission from the cruise director to leave the ship, even though my show was that night. Mm. I got up to London, blew up the balloons on the train, <laughs> and went to the workshop. That must have been a sight too. You I know. Who knew? <laughs> Try to control 30 balloons on a moving train <laughs> in wearing a golden catsuit. I do not wish it on anyone. It was ridiculous. But when I got there, the lady on the door said, I can't let you in. <laughs> oh. Like, I got it. I wouldn't have let me in. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have a, you have a I, sequin cat suit and 30 I know. Right, so she said, you're going to have to leave the book and the balloons there. And she pointed to the floor where it was all dusty and dirty. And there was my book all wrapped up with gold ribbons and, and the balloons. And, but then I showed her my pass, which was like 100 pounds to get into this workshop. Nice. So I went in and there's my idol. Elizabeth Gilbert standing in front of 400 people, all very serious. Yeah. I stood right at the back and I felt really, really sad. <laughs> <laughs> but then she said, she said, listen, everybody, if you want to achieve anything, you have to have persistence. You have to persist. And my heart started to beat. And she said, I want you all to get out your notebooks and to write a letter to yourself about what it is that you must persist with, whether mm -hmm. it's art or a book or your magic or whatever. You're thinking to yourself, is she speaking to me? Right? My heart was beating out my chest. Now, I had a, another book in my bag that wasn't signed, wasn't wrapped up, nothing, but it was just a book, you know, my book. And so I thought, I've got to do it. I've come all this way. I've spent a year getting this book finished to give to her. Everyone got out their notebooks and I had the heads down and no one was looking, no one was looking as I tiptoed past 400 women they were, all down to the um, stage. Even Liz Gilbert wasn't looking because she was writing in her notebook. And I put this book on the front of the stage and she looked up and looked at me like surprised and a bit annoyed at this terrorism ac action. Yeah. And I just shrugged and sprinted out of the theater. <laughs> As if someone was chasing me. <laughs> run away, run away. I did, I did, I ran away. And, and I jumped into a taxi and I went, oh my God, that was the most scary thing I've ever done. And the taxi driver said, what did you do? And I explained the story. And he said, well, bloody hell, if she was teaching about persistence, then that's what you had to do. Otherwise you, you wouldn't have been doing it. And so now persistence is my watchword with this book. And so forget my friends, they have all got to buy it, but I'm not going to stop until it's in every airport and on the bestsellers list. And... Well, I'm dying to know the end of that story. Did, did she ever contact you? No. Oh. Wait, wait. She didn't contact you yet. Right. But you know what? I think it was a gift because she gave me this word, persistence. And now I ain't going to stop. I've yeah. dedicated this book to her and Oprah and a few other people like Pink and Marie Forleo, who are big heroes of mine. So I'm not going to stop until I'm sitting on Oprah and she calls in this Gilbert and someone else brings in 30 golden balloons. Oh, yeah. And I give her the golden balloons and I've still got the, the, the spare copy of the book that I have for her wrapped up in a, my wishing box. Uh -huh. And my wishing box has a sign on the top saying, everything inside this box is. <laughs> We're magicians, right? Yeah. Right. So if, if magicians can't make magic happen, then who can? Right. Right. When you were writing the book, did you have any idea that this was going to happen? No. Basically, how it happened was that I'd given the book up. You know, I'd written, I'd written the book mm -hmm. in four months, bam. And I didn't practice. Basically, what happened was I was talking to my life coach and I was moaning about practicing the Chinese sticks. Okay. So I'm practicing the Chinese sticks, which now that I can do them, don't take a lot of practice, but at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was August. And I was pulling on one pom-pom and pulling on one while all my friends were at the beach. And so oh. I was complaining and I said, oh, I have to stay inside and pull on this tassel and the other tassel goes up. And he said, what would you rather be doing? And I said, I'd rather be writing. And I never said that before. Mm -hmm. And so for four months I wrote, but I didn't practice in that time at all, nothing. Oh. And then suddenly it was Christmas and I was like, oh my God, I've got all these shows. <laughs> I haven't yeah. practiced for four months. I had to really put the book aside and start practicing and the book got forgotten for six months. Oh until my friend said, hey, this is Elizabeth Gilbert workshop, shall we go? And I was like, oh, wow, I could, if I got my finger, if I pulled my finger out, I could give her the book. Oh, there's your deadline. Right, so she was my deadline. And so that was why she was so important to me. And so okay. that was the deadline, yeah. 
All right. But hey, we're not talking about magic. All the magicians are going to go, oh my God, they're not talking about magic. <laughs> well, we'll get right? to that. <laughs> to your, your character and, and magic mm-hmm. and all of that. But let's finish off with your book. So how can right. someone get a hold of your book? Well, it's on Amazon everywhere. So it's on Amazon all over the world. And it's just fun into gold, The Secret Life of a Female Magician by Romany Romany. But if you are listening to this from Australia, apparently it's much cheaper to get the book on Book Depository, which has free shipping. Oh. Um, and it's on Kindle. And what I really, really want, if you do read it, I really, really would love a review on Amazon or just to write to me to tell me that you've read it because that is my favorite thing at the moment. I may have to review it on this podcast. Yeah. Okay, good. It's for my birthday. Pardon the interruption, but I had to tell you about this. So I was in bed totally asleep. It was about two in the morning and my phone pings, a Facebook message. Usually if I get a message at two in the morning, it's an emergency from one of my daughters, but it was from Romany. I'll read it. Me here, you're probably asleep, but woke up thinking that it might be a good idea to put an offer in with your podcast. The offer is this. If they go to www.romanymagic.com site and sign up to my mailing list within 24 hours of the podcast, I'll send them a free Kindle slash ebook of my book. If they miss the deadline, they can email me and I'll do the same. I thought, what a deal. So, Make sure to go to www.romanymagic.com or shoot her out an email to get her a free Kindle version or ebook of Spun Into Gold. Now back to the show. The Secret Life of a Female Magician. Let's talk about that female magician thing. Right. Last night, I was thinking about this and I thought, what magicians do I know off the top of my head? And then I listed, you know, David Copperfield and all these different people. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, do I know any female magicians? I couldn't think of any, so I Googled it. Yeah. And here's what I found. I actually found a list. A lot. Yeah, yeah. They, I, I found a lot. I found a ranker list of the top 15. Ironically, and it kind of kind of made me a little bit angry, the third one, John, the Pendragons, mm. is a husband yeah. and wife team. It's not even a specifically right. female magician. And Jonathan, lovely as he is, is not a woman, definitely. Not that I know of. I have no personal knowledge, but I know he's a friend of mine. So we know that he's oh, a woman. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but then the fifth one was really interesting because the uh, ranked fifth is called the Magic Babe Ning. All right, but she's really good. She is great. That's um, Ning the Magic Babe or something. Yeah, I, I, have, I have no doubt that she's terrific, but we mm. don't say David the Beefcake. Uh, <laughs> we don't say that. That's uh, not what we call him. No, but <laughs> no, but that's her. That's what she's got as her name, and she's very sexy. And she, and you know, in Vegas we had the what were those topless magicians? Uh, I, I have no idea. There was um, a show of dancers, and the show was topless. Oh, they were doing great magic because, of course, they were highly trained theatrical professionals. So they did it really well. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, so actually you forgot after a while that they were topless. They were all quite flat-chested as well because they were all very thin. I watched the show and I, I was really impressed because they're professional dancers who tend to perform really well. I think I might have seen that Google, the, the 15 rankings. I don't think I'm even on it, am I? <laughs> well, am I? not yet. And so I sort of thought, ah, what do they know? But actually there's lots of, magici- lots of female magicians. It's just that for some reason or another, we're not highly publicised. I mean, I've known loads. We've got Luna Shimada, we've got Lisa Menon, we've got Jen Kramer, who's got her own show in Las Vegas. Now let's talk about your performing career. And mm. you're, I watch some of your videos and you're fun and funny. I call you unashamedly flirtatious. Yes. <laughs> I didn't mean to be. It is a character. As I think I said to you when I was explaining some things I was doing the day, which is probably getting diesel from my van or getting the shopping or something. I, I sort of consider Romany the roadie of the Romany diva of magic. Oh, yeah. It's almost like a different person. A bit like Jeff Hobson. You know, he's got this wonderful character on stage. And if you talk to Jeff Hobson off stage, he's really quiet. Right. I'm like that with the diva of magic. I'm not flirtatious in real life, but the diva of magic, goodness me, she can't keep her hands off people, men or women. She is really affectionate to everybody. Men are intoxicated by her. Uh... You know, actually, I was at the castle only in June. And obviously, I was getting two men up every night. And one thing I learned, because there was obviously lots of good-looking young men in the castle, and I got them up. And I thought, you know what? Older men are much funnier. 
really much funnier because it's not so much about them. The, the younger men are more self-conscious and more acting. Oh, yeah. And the older men are settled into themselves and are easier to play with. Ah. It's even funny. So on the cruise ships, obviously, lots of the men are older. And so it's so nice to get maybe an older man, you know, with a, a good belly and probably no hair. And the diva magic thinks they're fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's like, oh, oh I'm gorgeous. Mm. And they feel wonderful about themselves. Yeah, but it's all real. You know, she just is like, oh, goodness me. Yeah, she's... <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. How did you come up with that character? Was that, was that character organically created or did you? So I, I spent 20 years really trying hard to do technical magic. And when I say technical magic, I'm not even talking like great technical magic. I'm just talking a bit of magic. Mm -hmm. it took me forever. But the character was there before I even started. Uh -huh. So lots of people say, oh, you've got a great character. Whatever you could do in that character, you can, you know, it's easy for you. And I was like, yeah, it is true. The character was easy. What she says just comes through. Ad-libbing is just easy. And the comedy is just easy. Right. Yeah. So I'm sort of the opposite to, to many magicians because they, they seem to be very good at magic. They practice and they were very good at magic. And maybe they didn't have a character or they didn't have a script or they didn't have things to say. But I was the opposite. There are kind of two schools of thought. One is being technically amazing. Mm -hmm. And the other is having a wonderful character. And some do yeah. both. David Williamson does both, doesn't he? He's super funny, super great, and he's got the chops. The Hal Myers. Exactly. Does both. Paul Romhani, David Copperfield, lots of, you know, right. basically all the greats have both. Well, there, there are so many people that are technically way better than me, way better oh, than God, anybody yeah. I've ever seen yeah. in their basement doing card tricks. But, you know, I had this awkward moment with Jeff where years ago where he came into my hotel room we were at a, a conference and I showed him what I was doing and he said where's all the magic we've been working on he said what's the difference between you and an actress magic you know he said you're coasting on your personality ah. and then he left the room <laughs> and ah. I was really upset <laughs> but you know he, he didn't know that I had been working on lots of magic but it hadn't worked so he had no evidence of this. He could just see that I was just doing shows based on my personality. Right. But that made me knuckle down and try and get something to work. Mm. It's still not easy. The BBC, which people could listen to if they wanted to, the BBC did, um, I'll give you the link later, a half hour documentary on me trying to up my birdcage act for oh. the castle. Okay. So I got new music composed. I had a choreographer i had jeff mcbride helping me i did all this stuff for six months and it didn't come to anything and oh. i've gone back to my original act oh. oh is that true the um, documentary is interesting and lots of people said oh we'd love to see the act but the reality is bob fitch who probably everyone knows was is just fantastic he came into the castle to see me and i said what do you think he went mm. <laughs> He didn't think it was an improvement on the last act. And he was right. And I'd gone back to the original one. I, that was a year of work. But the original was better. These things take time. Or sometimes they don't come out. Right. And, and you, well, you learn so much in the process of putting the, mm. those together, even if the final show doesn't work. Yeah, you're always learning. Yeah. I am going to put that link on your show notes page, by the way. But bear in mind, when you're listening to it, when I'm talking about the mirror... It didn't really work because <laughs> lots of people have written back and said, oh, we'd love to see your new mirror act. <laughs> smoke and mirrors. It's all smoke and mirrors. It didn't really work. Now tell me about your meteor performing with or for Prince Charles. Well, that was amazing. And that was something I didn't manifest. I didn't think that up. That was just a phone call on a Tuesday afternoon saying, this is how it sounded. Excuse me, could you come and perform? for the palace <laughs> and I was like uh um, what palace <laughs> yeah which palace which palace and who for and he said Prince Charles and his friends can you do 10 minutes oh. well 10 minutes for me is hard you know you've got to establish a character yeah I said mm. I said can I do 15 <laughs> <laughs> and they said yeah and so I I rocked up and I wasn't nervous because I knew Prince Charles is a really nice guy 
And I knew that he had a similar sense of humor to me because we listened to the same old fashioned vintage stuff on the radio. Because mm-hmm. I am so old fashioned. I, I've never had a television in my life. Oh. And what I do all day long is listen to vintage comedy or podcasts or whatever. You know, so I've been listening to a lot of comedy and I know that Prince Charles listened to the same thing. So we've got the same comedy. I just knew he'd be really nice. So, but when I got there, which is a bit bad and Hal Mayers, who's a consummate professional and who believes that you just stick to your time. Mm-hmm. So I should have done 15 minutes, but I thought this is my moment. <laughs> I'm doing 30. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did it and it was all, it was really fun. It was really worth it. I do the jacket escape. And that, that was the thing you did on Penn and Teller, Penn right? and Teller, yeah. It's my favorite thing. It's great. Because just so much comedy you can get out of it. It's great magic too. Yeah, it really is. So when I got to the palace, they said, okay, we, we know you need two men, but we want you to use the head of royal security and Prince Charles's um, personal policeman. Mm-hmm. I was okay. like, oh. Now all the magicians will know that it doesn't matter. SAS could tie me up yeah. and I'm still going to get out of it. So that was just a really good gig. And then afterwards I met him and he was just really charming and we had photographs taken and yeah. But you know, it was one of those things that was just fell into my lap. I didn't do anything to get it. And it was just a really pleasurable thing. I performed for a number of, of stars here in Southern California and same thing. Right. You get that phone call and you're like, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, but I bet you charged them. I bet you had a fee, right? Well, most some of the times you don't know it's them. Uh, for example, one time, I think I was telling you this before, I performed for Tommy Lee at, at his party and Tommy wow. Lee was there and uh, Daryl Hannah was there. But I was called by his agent and I uh, didn't know that. So nice. I forget his agent's name. To, I didn't recognize the name, so I gave him my regular price. Good. And yeah. then when I received the check, It was signed and it was from Tommy Lee and it was signed Tommy Lee and it was for what Tommy Lee probably thinks is a very, very small amount. Right. And I looked at the check and I said, dang it, I should have charged a lot more. Yeah. You know what? When you work for British royalty, you don't get paid. Nobody gets paid. Penn and Teller don't get paid. But it looks great on your website. It really does. And it was really good fun. And I'm a big fan of Prince Charles. So it was really nice. All right, well, we're going to move on to fact or something John just made up. Is it fact? Or is it something John just made up? So here's how it works. I'm going to read a headline, and you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little bit about it. Okay. (laughs) First headline, Romany's main criteria for making the decision to continue living in Las Vegas or go home to England, was sheep. That is totally true. Oh, (laughs) Totally true. And I thought that was normal. And it was only when I told that to uh, an audience on a question answer thing on a cruise and they all laughed. These were Americans and they all laughed. I was like, huh, (laughs) maybe it's not so normal. I heard a voice and it said, leave your husband, sell your house go to Las Vegas, Mm. which I did. And there I am in Las Vegas and I've had a great time. And I think, shall I stay? And everyone's saying, you must stay. Mm -hmm. When I got home to England to really make the decision, I was cycling through a green fields around my house and there's lots of sheep. And I was like, huh, Vegas doesn't have any sheep. And that was it. I was like, no, I, I mean, very English. And I really, really want to live in the countryside with a sheep. And that was a big decision, which sounds mad, but yeah. I mean, I'm happy to go for six months or something, but basically we need, I need to be in green. (laughs) All right. We're going to go on to the next one. When performing at the magic castle, Romany lost one of her high heels. So instead of going back to the hotel to look for it, she did the entire show with one heel. not true (laughs) that's not true (laughs) that's news to me that'd be quite a show huh right but you know what i have i have there was one awful gig where i did show up without any shoes oh and i had to do the show in my tights and it was outside as well and i remember you know by the end of it i had holes in the in the bases of my tights because it was quite rough ground 
it's really hard to be the diva of magic with no shoes. Next one. Romani is a well-known ultra runner. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've talked about running a lot. Right. Right, yeah. Romani is not an ultra runner. In fact, if my friend Dave, who is an ultra runner, was here, he'd fall off the sofa laughing. <laughs> Romani likes going into the countryside to follow ultra runners, but she's pretty slow. She likes nothing more than to stop and have a look at the scenery. <laughs> the sheep. Right, and the sheep, yeah. I, so I'm not at all an ultra runner. My, my friend, I've got a friend called Dave, who's inspirational in many many ways and he's the guy that does the Tromsø sky race this is the, going up and down mountains in Norway he's mm. the guy that doctors said he shouldn't run again because he had a bone in his ankle or something and he just runs everywhere he was the guy that got me to pay thousands of dollars to get my book edited by the best people oh. because on a run uphill when he's talking to me to keep me from stopping I gave him this question, shall I spend all this money on good editing or not? And he said, why would you not make it the best you can make it? Mm. And he applies this in all of his life. And so he's been trying to teach me this since this, why would you not make it the best you can make it? Yeah. Well, that brings us to our, our next big headline. This is something people didn't know about you. Romani holds the world record for joggling, which is juggling while jogging. No, that's, that's not true either. That's, no. um, you know, I used to be a juggler, so, so I learned juggling at university. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. When I was at university, I, I, you know, I wanted to be a ballerina. That wasn't going to happen. I wanted to be a dancer. That didn't happen. I wanted to be an actress. That didn't happen. So at university, I joined the Circus Society oh. and I learned to juggle. And I thought this was amazing. And that's what I became, first of all. And then I married a juggler. Oh. And so we toured the world with um, a, a street performing show, which was fire juggling and whip cracking. Hmm. And so we did that for years. So, but I've never really juggled while juggling. No. <laughs> <laughs> Joggled. Yeah. I don't think I can even juggle anymore because I haven't done it for years. A friend of mine, uh, Micah Cover, actually does joggling. He does 5Ks and 10Ks and he actually does joggling. He juggles the whole time and he gets a lot of news coverage doing it. That was Fact Ooh. or Something John Just Made Up. Ah. All right, we're going to move on to our fan questions. You have a singular interesting fan question and it is from Hal Myers, which we both know, a.k.a. Damien. Hal asks, do you ever feel you get treated differently than your male counterparts at events where you and other Magi magicians are performing? There's been a sort of a, not a complaint, but an observation for many female magicians. Often at a convention, they'll only book one female magician. They're going to have the token female magician. And they say, mm. oh no, we've got one. We've got one female magician this year. Um, oh. So there's, there's that. Also, they have that often at gigs. They'll have one female magician. So there's that. I do think females, magicians, are judged much more on their look and their age than male magicians. You know, so yeah. I'm going to be 50 on Friday, which I think would count me out for many new television programs. But it wouldn't count out a 50-year-old man. That's right. Because 50 in female age is old or perceived as old, 20 or 30 is what they're looking for. But 50 in a man as a magician isn't old. Yeah, it's distinguished. It's distinguished. You know, people have read my book. I've spent my life trying to keep within the confines of my costume. And again, in the social media and that, they're always looking for, like Fox News, slim, young women. But that doesn't apply to men so much. So I, I know some many of my dearly beloved colleagues who really are not slim <laughs> um, mm. or pretty but yeah. um but they are talented and they are funny talented and funny i think should be enough um yeah. and i think in a live show it is because i know i can hold my own in a live show but i'm not 20 and i'm not not super thin so you know if those are the criteria which get applied then that is the difference well there is a huge difference between 
performing and making your performance accepted by the general public and being booked yeah. for that performance. Yeah. Usually what happens is they hire young dancers, professional dancers in their 20s or early 30s and teach them some illusions and then put them in the show rather oh. than having magicians who have spent 20 years, you know, learning the craft. Right. And again, because what's important in the show is glamour and youth. That is a, a disappointing thing in this day and age. Yeah, that brings me to a thought. As a male magician, I have all sorts of people that I can look up to, people that I've, I've thought about throughout the years, different magicians that have done different things. But as a woman magician, who do you look up to? Right. Um, there's one character, Faye Presto in England, who's now 70. Mm -hmm. And I look up to her for her indomitable spirit. She has not been treated very fairly by the, the magic community. She doesn't think I'm 70, who's gonna book me? She just absolutely expects to be booked at great prices because she's a really good performer. I look at her for persistence, tenacity, determination, and the sheer chutzpah of I'm good, book me. She is, by the way, number one on the ranker list. For my female heroines, I don't look to really anyone in the magic world. I look to people like Pink. Pink is a great, mm. she's an amazing performer. She fills stadiums. She is spectacular. So people like her, Barbara Streisand, I basically, it's all the musical big stars I look up to. Lady Gaga, these really big stars. Ellen, these women who knock it out of the park whenever they perform. These are the people I look up to. But you know what? I have to say, I didn't make it easy for myself. It wasn't that people were being prejudiced against women or whatever. You know, again, <laughs> if you read the book, you'll find out that I was making it harder for myself. And that's why it took me so long. I was trying to reinvent the wheel. And so, you know, it wasn't that I wasn't being allowed into some citadel. I was just trying the wrong things and going about it the wrong way. And that's really why it took me so long. But now, now you're on top of the world. All I ever wanted was an act. I wanted, what I kept writing down every day in my notebook, I used to say, I have a beautiful act that is full of beauty and wonder and makes people smile. That's what I wanted. I wanted the audience to leave the show feeling a little brighter, a little lighter and feeling, you know, like when you've heard a wonderful story or when you've laughed or when you've seen a great song, that feeling, I, that's what I wanted to do. And for as long as they're watching my show, whether it's 45 minutes on a cruise ship or 10 minutes in a theater, or whatever, I wanted them to forget all their worries for that moment of time. And that was, that is, and still is the, the height of my ambition. It's not to be a mega star or whatever. It's that everyone that watches the show forgets their worries for as long as they're watching me. The BBC asked me, they said, why is it, you're so passionate about this. And it actually made me cry because I said, listen, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not building great buildings. All I'm trying to do is just make people a, a bit happier and get them to laugh. Yeah. In fact, we're going to end on those uh, lovely words of yours. Where can they get a hold of you or get your book, get a hold of you and all of that? Well, the, the book, as I said, is on Amazon. That's everywhere spun into gold. Um, my website is romanymagic.com. There's clips of my shows on there. My author site, Romany Romany. And there's lots and lots of pictures. Twitter is Romany Sequin. And Instagram mm -hmm. is Magic Romany. But um, it's all on my website. Thanks, Romany. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend. That's how we can spread the word. Also, make sure to get your free audiobook from audible.com. Just go to thevarietyartist.com slash book to get your first book for free. Oh, wait. Are, are you on? Oh, I'm, I'm, do I'm recording it at the moment. So by Christmas, it will be on Audible. Ah, yeah. that could be their first book for free. Yeah. <laughs> on audible.com. Yeah. It's taken forever to edit it. Yeah, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can reach me at uh, my email address at john at the variety .com, or join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. Oh, by the way, make sure to go to romanymagic.com or shoot her out an email to get your free Kindle version or ebook of Spun Into Gold. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. 
Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.